Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Han Din uh, from uh, TDD Institute. Uh, today, it's a great honor for me to introduce Professor Frank Wiercheck as the lecturer of the first class uh, of the advanced topic in theoretical physics for other graduate students of Zhuyuan Honors Program. By the way, uh, I'm also from uh, the Sidian Ban, uh, for 86 uh, class. Uh, and uh, as you know, in physics, there are three major areas. One is to study something very small, like fundamental particles. The second is to study something very big, like our universe. The third, is to study something very many, like solid materials. Most physicists focus in one area, even in one sub-area. But today's lecture is one of the very few who survey all of three areas and made extraordinary contribution to these areas. 50 years ago, in 1973, at age of 22, only a few years older than uh, most of you here, Frank, together with his uh, 
advisor, Professor David Gross, wrote a paper titled Ultraviolet Behavior of Non-Abelian Gauge Theories and offer a beautiful explanation why inside a proton or neutron, three quarks can loosely bound together, but no single quark can be freed from the confinement. Their theory discovered that the electric magnetic force which act on a property called charge. The strong nuclear force which holds quarks together act on a property called color. Or you may think something as uh, like a glue. This paper together with a back-to-back -back PIL paper by uh, David uh, Pollitt, then a Harvard graduate student at the age of 24, made groundbreaking contributions to the basic theory, so-called QCD, for the strong force, a cornerstone theory for the very small particles, and helped three of them winning the Nobel Prize in physics in 2004. Besides this beautiful concept of color, of QCD, uh, Professor Wilczek has also come up with some exotic and beautiful concept, such as axion, which has been considered as a candidate of dark matter of our very big universe. And another example is anion, which unlike fermion or boson, can have fractional charge and the fractional statistics. And in my own research, Majorana zero mode is a special kind of anion. A third example is time crystal, a crystalline order in time, a different form from the usual crystalline order in space we see in the very many world. In addition to all these great discoveries, Professor Wilczek has also made a great impact in popularization of science, wrote a monthly Wilczek's universe feature for the Wall Street Journal, and published several, several well-known books. I read his book, A Beautiful Question, in both English and the Chinese version. And I found it is by far the best popular science book I have ever read. By the way, the Chinese uh, translation is great. His latest book, Fundamentals, will release its Chinese version in a few days, uh, this Sunday. And I would uh, highly recommend these two books to all of you. It is a rare opportunity that young students like you can Listen a touring figure in both serious science and popular science in a close distance. Through a serious lecture on advanced topic in theoretical physics. I hope that you can be inspired by the beautiful concepts in these lectures and also ask some beautiful questions. With this, Please welcome Professor Frank Wilczek. Thank you for that very gracious introduction. And welcome all of you, thanks for coming. It's, it's really inspiring to see so many bright young faces. And now I'm gonna have to take a few seconds to get the technicalities <laughs> under control. So. So, uh, 
I'm not sure this is going to work smoothly, but I'm going to try. We'll try. Uh, so uh, this will be a series of eight lectures planned, and I should tell you what what the plan is. Uh, this first lecture will be kind of unique. I wanted to give a lecture that I could give in my sleep, since I thought I might be sleeping after the long trip to China. Uh, it's going to be about quantum chromodynamics, QCD, the theory of the strong force, which was already mentioned. And I'll be uh, talking about some old ideas, but also some very new ideas, where QCD, I think, uh, is still a vital subject that, that is evolving and that is giving ideas that will be carried over into other parts of physics. And then the second lecture will be a kind of colloquium about time. It will, it's called Symmetries of Time, and it's kind of an introduction to then the more technical lectures, which will be uh, the rest. That uh, I'll be giving a series of lectures especially revolving around this, the concept of time reversal symmetry and its implications. Uh, one big part of the story will be the story of axions, which are meant to resolve some fundamental issues about time reversal symmetry in physics, and amazingly and very encouragingly uh, turn out to also be an excellent candidate to provide the dark matter of the universe that cosmologists need. And then at, uh, I'll be talking about time reversal in matter, and finally, time reversal in biology, which is a new frontier that I think is very interesting and exciting. Okay, so without further ado, let's begin. Let's begin. <laughs> okay, so uh, confinement made simple and then complicated. So confinement is a characteristic feature of quantum chromodynamics. That I will explain what it is first and then why it was, it caused us a lot of trouble in the early days of QCD. Uh, but uh, now, looking back, we can understand it in simple terms, and the question becomes to apply that insight to uh, get a better description of matter in new circumstances. So that's the story I'll be telling, and I'll tell along the way, we'll have several new concepts that will be introduced that uh, I'd like, I, I made special words for so that they could be memorable. So real virtuality, you've probably heard of virtual reality, but this is, this is the converse. Uh, sticky gluons, there's a glue which not only glues things together, but also sticks to itself. Trions, which are things you make trees out of, but also th things you make protons and neutrons and out of in, in this context. And finally, uh, the idea of flux channeling, which is a way of carrying over ideas that we develop in understanding sticky gluons to trying to make photons sticky and, uh, and use the wisdom we acquire from QCD in uh, controlling matter better. So uh, this year was the 50th anniversary of my original paper uh, that really uh, helped to found modern QCD. And uh, my students arranged a celebration at MIT here. And these balloons are representations of uh, protons and neutrons with three quarks inside. Uh, this kind of picture is actually something uh, inspired or that, that calls to mind the so-called MIT bag, which is a model of protons and neutrons where you separate two phases on the inside and the outside, and the quarks are trapped inside the, uh, inside the balloon, inside the so-called MIT bag. 
And uh, a characteristic of QCD is that although there's a lot of evidence for the existence of quarks, I'll show you uh, momentarily how direct and dramatic that evidence is, uh, we never see quarks in isolation, but always inside bags, either with uh, quarks and antiquarks, that those are mesons, or in combinations of three quarks that are baryons. And in general, the number of quarks minus antiquarks has to be a multiple of three. That's, that's called confinement. So you never see a single quark or a combination of two quarks, but you can see things that are made out of three quarks or a quark and an antiquark. <coughs> But although you can't see quarks in isolation, you can see their manifestations very directly uh, when you do experiments at high energy. So this is an electron-positron collision. All this red stuff is the machinery that makes that happen. So an electron and an anti-electron collide, and things come out, strongly interacting particles, things we account for in terms of quarks and gluons come out. Uh, but but these are, none of these are individual quarks or gluons. What they are is something called a jet. A jet is like a lightning bolt initiated by a quark or gluon, but uh, the, the material that actually emerges is obeying this rule of confinement. So it's a proton, neutrons, mesons, maybe antiprotons, things like that, but never individual quarks. However, if you track the energy and momentum of all the particles in these jets, and you compare it to theoretical calculations of the energy and momentum patterns that should be left by quarks and gluons, they match precisely. So in a sense, you are seeing quarks and gluons here, not as individual particles, but as flows. The, quark, the, the flows of the actual particles you see reflect in their energy and momentum, their angular distribution, also the number of quarks and anti-quarks and gluons you produce with different probabilities. All of those can be calculated based on the reality of quarks and gluons and then you see uh, a successful comparison of theory and experiment. So in a real sense, you are actually seeing individual quarks and gluons, uh, although you never see them at low energies. You see them this, in this indirect way. And that's the problem of confinement. How is it you can have building blocks of the world, of the strongly interacting particles, that exist in the theory that are clearly manifested in experiments and yet never exist as individual particles. It's quite different from atomic physics where you can take apart the atoms into electrons and nuclei and you can study the electrons separately and the nu nuclei separately. This tension, this unusual feature is the problem of confinement. The particles out of which we build the theory are not the particles we see, and the particles we see are not the particles out of which we build the theory. <coughs> and, and some people find, still find this disturbing. We certainly found it disturbing in the early days when we didn't have confidence that the theory was correct, and those high energy experiments really didn't exist in a mature form. The evidence was nowhere near so good. Uh, so this, this was, uh, oh, okay, thank you. Uh, all right, good. This will be ready for the question session. <laughs> all right. Before you discuss all right. the curriculum all right. <laughs> Okay, great. So now, all right. Uh, <laughs> and some people still find it disturbing. Uh, in fact, the, the Clay Institute in mathematics has offered a $1 million prize for the proof of 
a weak version of uh, this phenomenon. Uh, but physicists who don't demand proof or don't demand mathematical uh, rigor in their proofs, uh, uh, I think by now are pretty well satisfied, <laughs> and I'll show you why. So let's discuss this problem of confinement in as simple a way as possible. So here, we're going to discuss, instead of the strong interactions in three dimensions, the real three plus one dimensions, the real thing, we're going to discuss an imaginary world of just electrodynamics, QED, in one space and one time dimension. And we'll see a very, very similar kind of phenomenon occurs to confinement. So we're following here the advice of uh, Albert Einstein to make everything as simple as possible, but not simpler, so to capture the idea, and also the advice of uh, a somewhat lesser, <laughs> lesser physicist to uh, do a, a what we can get away with. <laughs> and if, the, if things get complicated and look messy, that's sometimes, often, a sign that there's a better way to do it. <clears throat> so, three plus one dimensional non-abelian gauge theories sort of are considerably more complex than uh, one, the one plus one dimensional abelian gauge theory we're going to discuss, uh, but they're gloriously difficult and have been a rich source of problems and phenomena that people are still grappling with, very much so. And, uh, but, in one, but this key phenomenon of confinement, we can discuss, we can discuss uh, intelligently in a much simpler context, and we learn from it. We'll learn this concept of real virtuality. So, uh, this is Lagrangian density. Don't be frightened by this if it's, if it's uh, frightening. <laughs> this is just uh, the way of encapsulating the Maxwell equations or the, the basic equations of electrodynamics in one plus one dimension. And this is the propagation of a spin one half fermion in the presence of these electromagnetic interactions. Uh, but I've called it Q because it's meant to look like a quark. So the analogy is this, these photons in one plus one dimension will be like the gluons in three dimensions, and the fermion, the charged particle, will be like the quarks. Okay, and then uh, a little bit of technology. If we impose A1 equals zero gauge, and if, if you don't follow this, take it as poetry, and we'll, you, you'll, you can fill it in later. Ching Dong will help you. <laughs> uh, then if you do that, then the gauge field part contains no time derivatives, and we can use the, gate, the equations of motion to eliminate it. So that's the derivation of a very simple picture that emerges when you analyze this theory. All the theory is, is a force. So in one dimension, if you have electrodynamics, there's no such thing as radiation. <laughs> there's just a force. You can capture it all in terms of just a force between the charged particles. And you still have a form of Gauss's law that the amount of flux coming out of a particle is reflecting the charge of the particle inside. But since you're in one dimension, the Integration of the flux is very simple. It's just constant. <laughs> the flux can't go away. Uh, and so what happens is you have, if you have a charged particle, an electric flux comes out of it that can only end on the op particle of opposite charge. <clears throat> and that means that there's a constant electric field between these two. That means there's a constant energy per unit length 
as you separate these particles. So it's like a constant force. The energy per unit length is constant, so there's a constant force. No matter how far they're away, one is away from the other, it's a constant force. And if you think about it, that's the essence of this confinement problem. So the force, on the one hand, is inexorable. It never stops. So to separate a quark and an antiquark and isolate them would cost an infinite amount of energy. You very rarely have an infinite amount of energy. In fact, never. So the quarks can't be confined, can't, can't be separated. But on the other hand, if the force is weak, and we're allowed to make the force weak in our thought experiments, uh, then the force can be very, very weak. It's, it's very weak, but it doesn't stop. And so that's exactly what we want to have in QCD. We have a weak force at short distances, but inexorable. So, so the quarks look like things that are physical, that have an existence, if we, if we can look down to short distances or, or high energies. Uh, but they never exist as free particles. They always, their charge always has to be canceled somehow. So now let's sharpen that idea to bring out the paradox of confinement more clearly. So in this theory where we just have a force, we have, so we have these heavy guys and a weak force uh, between them, but a weak force that doesn't quit, we can calculate using elementary quantum mechanics uh, the wave functions of the, of the bound states. We get, we get bound states. Those are the analogs of mesons, which would be a quark and an antiquark in three dimensions. And what we find is that there's, there are bound states with different configurations of the wave function of the quark and anti-quark. There's an, uh, and uh, starting at twice the mass of the quark, and then because there's extra energy in the electric field going up a little bit, you find a spectrum of bound states with discreetly different energies. Uh, all the way up until you have four quarks, and then you can produce two, you can produce two mesons. And so then you have starting a continuous spectrum starting from, from there. But for this discussion, we'll mostly be focusing on the energies such that uh, we're below that 4M. We're over, over 2M, but below 4M, so we have a discrete spectrum. So we can solve for the bound states using the Schrodinger equation. And in fact, I'll show you the, the, the derivation on the next slide. I won't walk through the algebra, but the idea is very simple. We can use the WKB method to uh, analyze what these bound states look like. Uh, because the force is weak, they can be very spatially extended, so they have many nodes. And that means we can use uh, the approximation that there are many nodes, the WKB approximation, in order to get uh, all but the few lowest states very accurately. And this is what one finds the energy, the, in terms of the number of nodes, so counting up the states as they go up in energy. They go up like n to the two thirds, the charge to the four thirds divided by m to the one third. Uh, and the splittings, therefore, you just differentiate with respect to n, you find that the splittings get smaller and smaller as n grows. So the states are getting compressed. <clears throat> and uh, here's the derivation. It's a nice exercise that should be within the scope of uh, undergraduate education <laughs> to, uh, to look to calculate the bound states using the WKB method. So 2 pi n is the integral of dxp. So this was 
something that even people like Bohr and Sommerfeld could have computed before the advent of modern quantum mechanics. Okay, so that's the picture that we get if we analyze the states of energy. So what does that mean for reactions? So as a thought experiment to see what this does for uh, dynamics, for processes that occur in space and time, let's consider a process analogous to the E plus E minus annihilation, who's that picture, that kind of picture that I showed you earlier. Okay, so we have, these are the quarks and the gluons. The gluons have just sort of vanished to make a force. Uh, and uh, we have to introduce separately some fictitious things that'll be the electrons and the electromagnetic force. So we make an even more weakly coupled theory and let it couple in, mimicking the situation of electrons and positrons coupled to quarks and gluons in three plus one dimensions that we're trying to model. And what you realize then immediately is a kind of paradox. When the energy is not one of these bound state energies, there's nothing to scatter into. There's nothing there. So the electron and positron posit, posit, uh, don't notice that they're all these strongly interacting particles. They just uh, propagate through. <clears throat> On the other hand, it's obvious physically you just have these particles that are interacting very, very weakly with each other. You produce a particle, an antiparticle. They should prop, they should move freely. So this is the paradox of confinement, really in a very simple and tangible level. The, on the one hand, common sense tells you that the particles should be visible and propagate freely. On the other hand, if you look at the S matrix, if you look at a more sophisticated way of analyzing things, you find the paradoxical thing that, well, first of all, you find that actually these particles don't exist as individual particles, but then also and that's reflected in the dynamics as a prediction that nothing happens if, unless you choose some very special energies. So how do we resolve these two very different, or reconcile these two very different pictures. And the, the, uh, the reconciliation is very beautiful, I think, and instructive. It involves the uncertainty relation between time and energy, and also the basic concept in quantum theory of complementarity. So in quantum, in elementary classes on quantum theory, you may hear that there is no energy time uncertainty relation because time is not a quantum mechanical variable. So you don't, you don't have the same sort of thing as you have for position and momentum. Uh, where position and momentum are operators, you mess around and find this. You can't measure one accurately without the other. Uh, but I'll show you that there definitely is a time energy uncertainty relation. And in fact, it's not different conceptually from the uh, energy, from the position momentum uncertainty relation fundamentally. Uh, and then as an application, we can resolve this tension between the S matrix on the one hand and common sense on the other. And the resolution is basically very simple. It's that the spectrum and the S matrix reflect the behavior of physics at infinitely long times. That's how the S matrix is constructed. It's kind of a limit of long time descriptions. And that's often a very useful approximation in the strong interactions where things happen very fast. So, but uh, it's not a full description of how physics works because life is finite. 
we're allowed to take things, we're allowed to look at things that only last for a while. So let me show you this uncertainty relation. And since it's uh, elementary and important, I will actually do the derivation right before your eyes. So there's a, if we have any two operators, so Hermitian operators, x, y, two observables, if you like, that have a non-trivial commutation relation. So they, when x times y minus y times x is i times some other thing, z, uh, let's first take out the, we're going to evaluate this in, any, in, in, a in a state and show that this implies some minimal uncertainty in x and y. Uh, so to sharpen things, let's first take out the average values of x and y in that state. It didn't work. No. Okay. Next time. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. So now, uh, with that is, with that understood, we evaluate something that's necessarily positive. We take x plus i times any real number plus y and multiply it by its permission conjugate. So that has to be equal to or greater than zero. It's the square of this state from here to here, the absolute square. So, uh, and then we just multiply it out. We have three terms like that. This is the most complicated derivation I'll be showing you all in the whole lectures, because mostly I won't show derivations. Uh, and we assume this has, so uh, because it's equal to or is greater than zero, it can't have any real roots. If, it, if this quadratic form has a real root, then it goes through zero and goes on to the negative side. So we don't want that. And so we get an inequality that the expectation value of z squared is equal to or less than four times the expectation value of x squared and y squared. Okay. So the classic energy, the classic uncertainty principle is just z equals one here. In that case, this is a number, and you get four times the, expect, the uncertainty in momentum times the uncertainty in position, things like that uh, are bounded below by a finite number as a fundamental reflection of the fact that quantum mechanical observables are represented by uh, non-commuting numbers, things that when you multiply in different orders, you don't get the same answer. <clears throat> so now we apply that general relationship so up there that we just derived to the fundamental dynamical equation of quantum mechanics which tells you that the time derivative of an operator, this is all in the so-called Heisenberg representation. So the states are fixed, but the operators change in time. Uh, then, then you get this dynamical equation. So we're using the very fundamental principles of quantum mechanics, the commutation relations and the equations of motion expressed as a commutation relation. And just plugging in this version of x, y, and z up there, you get this relationship, which is helpfully put into a box, which tells you that the uncertainty in energy times what looks like it should be an uncertainty in time if you just cancel the a's. This would be the uncertainty in time squared. It says that you need, but if you're going to talk about uh, time, you have to have a way of measuring it. So A, you should think of A as a clock of some kind, of any kind. But whatever kind of clock you use, you can never defeat this limit in the uncertainty and how well you can tell time uh, without bringing in uncertainties in energy. Okay. So that's the energy time uncertainty relationship. By the way, the position observable, 
which is an observable in elementary quantum mechanics, is not an observable in quantum field theory. It's only an approximation. So if you really want a rigorous version, even of the ordinary uncertainty relation between position and momentum, you have to do something like this and refer to the instruments that measure the momentum, <coughs> or the position, rather, the position. <coughs> OK, so now we know that to measure energies accurately takes a long time. Now, so, uh, and then we recall that our energy spacings were getting very, very close together. That means if we want to resolve those energies, it takes a long time. Or reading it another way, if we only take a short time, we don't see those energy, don't, so don't see those discrete energy levels. And so the paradox that came in from thinking that nothing happens unless you're at one of these energies goes away because the energy is uncertain. <laughs> so the weird picture of dynamics that the our thought experiment or, or the S matrix suggested to us that nothing happens unless you're right at the crucial energies where there's a bound state uh, doesn't apply if you only measure in a finite amount of time, which is the usual case. And so, and that's a relief because it didn't, it, it, it violated common sense. <clears throat> so that was kind of a mathematical discussion. It's fun to visualize how this came about. How does the long time description build up into big, this paradoxical thing in such an elementary theory. Uh, and the point is that, just think of what's happening in space and time. The quark and the antiquark separate. They don't feel much of a force. So they separate for a long time, a long time, a long time, slowly losing energy. And only after a while, Decide, realizing that they're out of energy and they have to come back together. Okay. And then they keep doing that. Remember, the interaction is very weak, so they, they keep doing it. And they do it over and over again. And if we d don't resolve events in time, we'll be averaging over many cycles of this motion. <clears throat> or in space-time, it'll look like this, the quark and the anti-quark. Separate, come back together, separate, come back together, and keep going like that. And this is very similar, now in time rather than space, to how you build up diffraction patterns or interference patterns. Because these they keep coming. You have many ways of getting from the initial state to the final state uh, that are averaged over and they can interfere with each other. You can get destructive interference. So if you're at the wrong energy where there's no bound state, you get destructive interference. But you have to wait a long time for it to build up because these cycles are very, very slow. <clears throat> okay, so that's, that's how this paradox is resolved. And you can, although I don't think anyone's ever done it, it would be a, it's a nice exercise to show how you can build up also the, the diffract by similar, uh, a closer analysis, you could also associate, get, you calculate the actual wave functions based on this space time behavior, at least in the WKV approximation. So the lesson is that freedom and confinement are a beautiful example of complementarity that there are different descriptions of the same physical situation in quantum theory that are applicable in different circumstances. And you need both of them to do justice to reality. Here, freedom, which is what we get using the perturbative analysis of the theory. So you have a very weak force. That's just a fancy way of saying it's a weak force. Uh, 
is the appropriate description if you want good time resolution. So things move freely for short times because the force is weak. But on the other hand, the force builds up inexorably. And so if you want, and that changes qualitatively the energy spectrum, you get these interference effects, you get bound states, you get holes in the possible energies, and uh, that's the appropriate description if you want good energy resolution. And you can't have both. You have, if you want good. Okay, so that's, that's this, I hope, illuminating uh, this model theory of where you have freedom and confinement in a way that's easily understood. Now let's go back to QCD with this in mind. So the essential dynamics that makes three plus one dimensional QCD, the theory of the strong interaction, resemble one plus one dimensional QED is that the essence of the confinement in one plus one dimensional QED was that you had these flux tubes instead of electromagnetic fields going like one over R squared, they concentrate and make tubes because uh, in three dimensions, that's what happens in QCD. The gluons like to stick to each other. So instead of spreading uniformly, they make tubes. See, unlike, unlike photons in three dimensions or in one dimension, the, uh, the gluons carry color degrees of freedom. They carry colored charges. And therefore, they are interacting with each other. Okay? Unlike light beams, which pass freely through one another. So the, thank goodness, otherwise our vision of the world would be very, very cloudy. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the gluons feel very much feel each other, and so they, in fact, they want to stick, then they tend to be sticky. So asymptotic freedom, which uh, was mentioned earlier, that was a big breakthrough in this uh, whole story, shows the onset of that behavior, because the force starts out like 1 over r squared, but then gets stronger as you go far away. That's the beginning of the formation of this sticky tube. Uh, and I won't discuss this in any depth, but uh, a strong coupling expansion is possible in QCD if you uh, discretize it, put it on a lattice. That, and you, you also find this sticky behavior of flux to, of gluons and formation of flux tubes. But most of all, nowadays with supercomputers, it's possible to just calculate the consequences of the theory. And if you look at the numerical solution, this was this sort of visualization was pioneered by Derek Lineweber in Australia. And you put in sources of color, so heavy quarks like that, and calculate as a function of the distance what the gluon fields do. You find exactly that they form a tube. So this picture that was so simple and convincing in one plus one dimension is also the basic picture that works in three plus one dimensions, apparently. <clears throat> OK, so the title of this lecture was Confinement Made Simple, Then Complicated. We've done the simple part. Now we're going to add a little bit of complication, which I think this is, this is new and I think quite interesting and exciting. And the point is that uh, one elect which is elect one kind of color one kind of charge this is what you have in, in electrodynamics is very different from three because if you have photons they're electrically neutral but if you have gluons there's non abelian symmetry uh, then they're sticky but now we're going to look at this second inequality that three is much less than infinity. 
remember the confinement was in units of three, number of quarks minus number of antiquarks is a multiple of three. And so we have to understand that. That's very basic because we're built out of things that are uh, things that can be built out of protons and neutrons are basically three quarks. So it won't do to just have quarks and antiquarks. We also have to have a way of accommodating three quarks as building blocks of, uh, of matter. And I've been working on this with two really excellent students at MIT. <clears throat> so uh, this is a picture that appeared in the Nobel Prize poster for 2004. And it is wrong. Can, can you tell me what's wrong with this picture? What's that? A gluon. Yes, that's, that's right. The gluon, that's, that's one thing that's wrong, is gluons don't have the same kind of color as quarks. I think this is meant to suggest that this gluon has both green charge and red anti-charge. But you're on the right track. That, uh, uh, one thing, well, what's wrong is that quarks don't have faces. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, that's, no, that's, that's, no, that's not the only thing that's wrong. <laughs> the, the point is that this is not how the force between quarks in this kind of configuration works. It's not, the flux tube doesn't extend between a quark and a quark. It would extend between, it could start on a quark and end on an anti-quark, but if you have a quark and another quark, that doesn't work. Formally, there's a property called triality that's conserved. So that doesn't end. But let's just look at the pictures from, from Line Weber again. And you see that when you have three quarks, they find, form this kind of junction, a Y, or they make a Y if you like. And uh, that's, that's, how, that's how the force works. It's not. And here you see that this absolutely requires three. That's where the three comes in to form this junction that has three lines coming out of it, <clears throat> which is not infinite and not one. <laughs> okay. So how can we make a simple model of that? Well, we have several different choices. This was the choice in the wrong picture. If we just make, make charges, have three different uh, charge uh, versions of electrodynamics, make, make them separately. So a, a, a theory with three kinds of charges, and we put the charges like that, then it really would look like the picture. <laughs> We'd have forces, mutual forces between the quarks, like that. But that's not QCD. <laughs> we can do better if we have just one, uh, I'm sorry, if we have three different versions of charge and the, the, the quarks now have unit charge, so we don't have those tricky assignments, but the straightforward ones, and we add a new object, which I called a verton, which allows, which is charge minus the, which can absorb all the charge, and, and make a hub like that, which looks like the picture, looks more like the picture of what actually is happening in QCD. Or that's three different versions of, of, of the uh, emergent abelian theory. Uh, the best version, and even this can be improved, but it's more technical, uh, the best version is to have Three, char three things with just unit of charge, so not three different kinds of electrodynamics, but just one, a, a version of, a fake version of electrodynamics, and then the trion's an emergent kind of interaction. And then the trion has charge minus three, so it can terminate all the flux tubes and look like the picture that actually emerges in QCD. So the trion, which is the junction of these three, is obviously a crucial concept in QCD. It's what allows us to have baryons, people. Uh, so 
let's see if we can take it seriously. By the way, trion, why is it trion? Well, first of all, in many languages, not Chinese, I'm afraid, <laughs> tri, T-R-E, is the word for three. So in Swedish, it's tre. <laughs> Also, when you start to put these things together, they look like trees. If you have many quarks and anti-quarks, join them up this way, it starts to look like trees. So I think this is a, a very good name. OK, so if we try to take it seriously, the first thing is to see if it's actually correct <laughs> uh, and to test it out in different uh, experiments. Now, we can't actually do experiments in cleanly in, uh, without complications because, well, the strong interaction works very fast. It's hard to do experiments. Uh, and also, if you have light quarks, you can produce quark-antiquark pairs and the, and the flux tube will break. You can minimize the energy by having the flux tube break. So, but what you can do is take out the quarks at, as physical degrees of freedom Use, but have uh, sources of color charge that play the role of quarks and probe the, the dynamical degrees of freedom, which are just the pure glue. So we're interested in how the glue behaves, but we can probe it by putting in different kinds of charges and seeing how the glue reacts to it. <clears throat> so the first, well, an early, uh, 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 an early test of the trion concept would be the following. I should say none of these exper none of these numerical experiments, which is what we're talking about, none of them have been really performed yet. So this is an agenda for future exploration. But I think the numerical experiments, they're certainly in the spirit of what Line Weber already did, and uh, should with modern supercomputers should be easily uh, accessible. Okay, so. If we have two quarks and two antiquarks and put them in kind of a rectangular array like that, uh, one way to make the flux go would be this on the top. But if there's a constant energy per unit length, eventually, if the trion has a finite mass, it's better to do it this way, have only one long flux tube instead of two. So it's half the energy once you make the compensation for having produced this tree on and little junctions uh, on the two ends. So this will, if the tree on is a real thing, we can measure its mass. And this is how you could measure its mass by seeing when the flux configuration changes from this to this. We can do many other tests, however, to see if this concept uh, holds up. And I'm anticipating that it does hold up, so uh, I'll be very disappointed if it doesn't. Uh, so with multiple quarks and antiquarks, determining the optimal trion anti trion configuration defines a very nice mathematical problem that generalizes a classic problem of mathematics, which is called the Steiner problem. This, if you have a lot of points, how do you join them uh, with lines such that the, the, the distance is minimized. And since every length of flux tube co is costing us energy, we want to minimize the distance to find the minimum energy. So if we calculate numerically the uh, minimum energy configurations with, we still have to obey this rule of three, since we can only get rid of quarks and triples. If you have three m plus n quarks and n antiquarks, say, uh, then we try to minimize the length to join them, uh, subject to two simple rules. Directed lines go out of quarks and into antiquarks, and triples of lines can go into trions or out of antitrions. So we take our quark configuration, add trions and antitrions, and see, uh, take, uh, take a penalty for their mass and see what the minimum energy configuration looks like. And does it, does it look like what emerges from the numerical simulations? 
Well, the first thing is if you have just three quarks, this is a classic Steiner problem. You're trying to minimize the length of a line that joins them. And this was solved a long time ago using the Euclidean geometry. And it's the so-called Steiner point where you put the tree on. And it's a point such that uh, the, uh, the three lines that come out of it are at 120 degrees from one another. Let's see, that's not, I guess it's the, uh, well, yeah, it's this, this, and this are all at 120 degrees from each other. And here's, here's how you construct it. This is a nice exercise in Euclidean geometry. Uh, there are many ways to do it, but this is a particularly nice way. You make equilateral triangles on the three sides and then connect each of those to its corresponding uh, opposite vertex. And where the three lines intersect, they intersect in a point, and that point is, is the, the point where you should put the tree on. Okay. So that's the prediction. And the numerical experiments will test this prediction to you know, when the quarks are far apart to minimize the energy you should put a tree on there. And you can do more complex things, of course. I should. So here are what I think would be highlights of what happens when you do more complicated situations. So uh, in the simple baryon, we had just one trion in the middle. We had this Steiner thing. Uh, but if you have uh, two baryons, so six quarks, uh, you could, of course, make two trions and hook them up that way. But that might not be the most efficient. More efficient might be to do something like this. So spontaneously create a trion anti trion pair. So instead of just two trions, you have three trions and one anti trion. And this would be the, this is the prediction. Once you know the trion mass, you can calculate when this happens as a function of geometry. So there's a lot of confrontation between theory and experiment. Of course, the experiments are all numerical experiments, but they, you do what you can. Okay, and then uh, time is. Well, I'm, the time I'm over by more than h bar over four, I think. So I have to have to start have to start accelerating a little bit. Uh, so other other interesting things can happen. You might have several equivalent ways or nearly equivalent ways, energetically, of uh, putting down the trions. This is very much like in chemistry, where you have like in, in you have different ways of putting the bonds that are chemically equivalent, famously in benzene. So there are resonances. You can even, so this would be a threefold degeneracy when you have a hexagon like that. Uh, if you have an octahedral thing, then you can take any, you can make a tree on here and on the opposite face in four different ways. And so you have a fourfold degeneracy. And yeah, you can have a lot of fun with this. Here's, here's how it looks in a numerical simulation when you have the six things and then if you fill it out to an octahedron, you can make lots of pretty pictures. And that's, okay. And there's a lot of theoretical entertainment to be had and fundamental issues in numerical QCD. If you have degenerate configurations, how does that show up? in these numerical calculations. Presumably what happens is you'll, you'll over time, have, you'll spend some time in one configuration and then another. How do they change as, as you run the simulation? This is very interesting stuff to people who find this kind of stuff interesting. And then uh, to really do just, so this is what happens asymptotically when they're, when the things are far apart, the flux tubes form and take a, take a shape which is not independent of their origin, but it costs them something to form, so you get corrections uh, due, to, uh, due to that. Also, very long tubes will start to 
uh, wander a little bit, and that's called roughening. That will have to be taken into account. <clears throat> and then you can also check the basic idea that what is conserved is just the number modulo 3 of, uh, of quarks. I won't go into this because of the limitations of time, but if you ask, I'll be happy to uh, elaborate. So you can test the premises of this whole analysis and get more consequences by looking at not only quarks, which, for, which transform in the uh, fundamental three-dimensional representation of SU3, but by looking at things which transform in other ways, other kinds of charge. <clears throat> okay, now let me, I don't want to leave this out, so despite the time, I'm going to spend a couple, a few minutes to discuss this concept of channeling. So, we'd like to discuss things like how trions interact with each other, but it's not easy to make that the lowest energy configuration. So uh, there's an issue there. And similarly, we'd like to see how trions interact with flux tubes, and flux tubes interact with each other, and quarks interact with any of those. So, the, And there's a wonderful solution, an enrichment of this uh, kind of analysis to address that ad uh, addresses all those questions and that's the idea of going from MIT bags to MIT pits or mit pits <laughs> or in more dignified language restricting the flux tube into channels how do we do that these are all numerical experiments but you'll see they're also real world versions of this. So here's how we get trions to interact with each other, for instance. If we can force the flux to only be in a channel, then we can arrange that the different trions lie on top of each other. Okay. Remember the Steiner configurations would have the trions leaping off to the side, but if we don't allow that, uh, we get some, if we don't allow the flux to hook up that way, we can force it this way. How do we do that? Well, it's very, very simple. In these numerical experiments, we can, in a way that's perfectly realizable, in fact, it simplifies the calculations, and gauge invariant, everything you like, just put the coupling constant to zero outside the channels. So we change the rules by making the background space-time inhomogeneous, and we can force the flux to be in channels. So we force the theory to be like a one-dimensional theory, which it, it wanted to be, but now we can also direct the flux. So here's how we can get the tube-tube interaction, how we can get a tube quark interaction. We could also force the tubes to bend, see what their elastic properties are, and that could go into models of, of hadron behavior, or we can uh, make them rotate. And uh, there's a little joke that goes with that, but it's advanced English. It's, this would make the, the pit and the pendulum. You have the pit uh, moving like a pendulum. And this is a short story by Edgar Allan Poe called the, the Pit and the Pendulum, which is very famous in English. I recommend it. OK, then you can also have fractional tubes. Remember, in free space, it was continuation of unterminated flux tubes that gave us the confinement mechanism. But if we effectively make space not infinite, so it's like having uh, cavities in electrodynamics that confine the fields, uh, 
then uh, that, that infinity doesn't arise and we ha can explore new questions. So here is an interesting one among many. Uh, so we have a quark, we have this mit pit, and the flux tube would like energetically to form in one direction, but now there's no symmetry to tell it which way to point, so what happens? Does it snake around? <laughs> does it, does it uh, just pick a direction and then maybe slowly in a numerical simulation move around among those degenerate configurations? I don't know what happens. So it it's, gets really interesting. <clears throat> okay. Folks also see if, if flux tubes can fragment into subtubes. Is that what they want to do, or do they just, does the flux choose to go in one of the arms and not the others? I don't know. Interesting question. <laughs> okay, so now let's turn from QCD or these numerical experiments in QCD to what, to, uh, what we learned from it to, for more practical purposes. And, uh, G goes to zero, which is what we're implementing to make these channels, corresponds, if we look back at the uh, basic Lagrangian density or the equations of motion, it corresponds to epsilon goes to infinity, that is the dielectric constant goes to infinity in electricity, or mu goes to zero in magnetism. Okay, you may remember or may understand that the uh, basic energy or Lagrangian in electrodynamics is one half epsilon times e squared minus one half mu times b, one over mu times b squared. That's why it's this seemingly very different behavior is just a matter of how things were defined. But in either case, it means that there's a lot of energy to make the fields, and so the fields are zero. So that, that's the analog of making G goes to zero in, elect, in QED, QCD. Now, are those things realizable? Well, yes, there's one dram very dramatic case. You can have very polarizable materials. You can have very uh, good diamagnets. But most of all, most dramatically perhaps, you can have superconductors, which are perfect diamagnets. So in effect, they confine flux to tubes. So in a superconductor, you make channels of this kind just by drilling holes. You make normal regions uh, where the flux can go and, and, and the superconductor doesn't want to go. So, so you have channels just like that. And this is a way of transporting magnetic flux from one side to the other. So you can make a magnetic field over here and transport it over there. You can also, by changing the area of the tube, uh, increase the magnetic field strength, so it's because the, it's field strength times area that's because that stays the same. Or you can make a flux lattice and do interesting things, creative things. Okay, but in view of the time, I won't go into these possible applications. And then finally, this is the very last thing I wanted to discuss. One can uh, go back to the challenge. Yes? Okay, well, <laughs> okay, let's, let's save that for the end, and I'll come back to it. But you want me to make the, the concept of trions more precise, which I... Yeah. <laughs> 
Okay. Uh, well, I showed you the pictures, so it's not coming out of nowhere. It's coming out of those pictures. <laughs> and trying to do justice to those pictures. And more basically, doing justice to the existence of, uh, of, bar of particles that are based on three quarks. And why is it three? Why can't you, why can't you have two? Why, why is three special? And we saw the arrangement that makes it possible. Uh, let me just add one more remark, then we'll come back in a question session, uh, which, yeah. <laughs> the, uh, um, in, in the analysis of solids, there's a concept called umclap processes. You break translation invariance, but you have a kind of discrete translation invariance left over. And uh, in very gentle processes, momentum will still be conserved, but there's a discrete momentum transfer that you can have that breaks the translation symmetry. The trions are the umclap processes of uh, gauge, of the SU3 gauge symmetry. They're where the, the flux can jump by three, basically. I don't know if that helps. You asked for mathematically precise. If you want mathematically precise, then we have to go through these rigmaroles. But the, the imprecise definition is it's what's in those pictures. Right? And more pictures will be coming, so I hope so. Yeah. So they'll take on their life that way. Okay, so let's suppose that trions are uh, established and they have a mass and that their mass is much larger than the masses of the up and down quarks, which is probably the case since the up and down quarks are very, have essentially zero mass. So now we can play the same sort of game that chemists have been playing for decades of uh, so-called Born-Oppenheimer approximation, where we have heavy degrees of freedom, which kind of des describe a structure that moves slowly, and then light de degrees of freedom, which feel that structure and move around and, uh, and uh, make effective forces between the structural elements and well, plays out in the whole of quantum chemistry. We can do the same thing now for the strong force. If we have these trions, we'll be treated as, as if they're the nuclei of uh, atomic or molecular physics, and the quarks will be the electrons. And the, 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 the conceptual basis is very similar, although just the force law is different. And I think this, uh, this, has, this can be a way of replacing the MIT bag by something better, with apologies to my colleagues <laughs> of the, uh, at, 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 in the past at MIT, uh, because we know in QC there's not really a phase transition between two different parts of the world that defines a baryon. They, they, aren't, they aren't like that. What they are more like is things that interact with this Y kind of interaction. And so maybe that's a better starting point. And especially now we have the challenge of describing neutron stars with the same kind of precision and richness that we describe uh, ordinary stars with. We know the equations, they're the equations of QCD, but we don't know how to solve them in a practical way. This maybe could be a start. And because when the quarks are close together, uh, the force laws are uh, simpler and you, you don't have this, and the trions kind of get more distributed, the approximation of uh, treating the trions and, and the uh, quarks separately using molecular orbitals, if you like, instead of atomic orbitals, gets more and more important to do. And uh, I think just like ordinary stars are much simpler than the Earth, because we don't have chemistry, but just uh, high temperature statistical mechanics, I think it's quite possible that neutron stars will turn out to be much simpler than nuclei. And experiments on gravitational waves and modern astronomy that are telling us, going to tell us much more about neutron stars will allow us to access this kind of behavior if we can predict it. 
So we need, we're, it's, a, it's kind of a scandal in QCD that we know the equations, but we can't put them to work in describing neutron stars, and maybe this will give us an approach to that. So with that, I'll end this lecture. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. <laughs> okay. So I have more. Well, I'm not to the forty. Not to be negative, but I still right. I have a simple question. Yes. The strong force, by definition, is the change. Of the strong force is by definition is the exchange of a glo uh, gluons. But you said uh, at, there are attraction at between gluons. At a fundamental gluons. level, yes. Yeah. Yes. But there are attractions between gluons. Yes. But what is this attraction? Oh, it's the same attraction. It's, in a it's also a strong force? It's the strong force, yeah. It's all the same force. It's an, you can write down the equations of motion of Lagrangian in one line. Yeah. They look a lot like the Maxwell equations, but with uh, indices <laughs> that tell you that you have different, three different kinds of charge, okay. and you have actually eight different kinds of gluons with uh, one unit of charge, one unit of anti-charge. That would make nine, but you take out the, the neutral one, which is... Yeah, then that, that comes the next question. So, and then, then, but then, so then the gluons, they have... Some they have one, they have a color and an anti-color, but yeah. but they don't have zero, so it's not canceled. And then so you need more gluons to exchange. The tube is made is a yeah. collective thing made of many folk, many uh, gluons. Many gluons. Okay. Yeah, it's yeah. non. We call non perturbative. You have to okay. yeah. take Thank into you. account that there are many gluons. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Any from students? Okay. <laughs> we could. <laughs> you can, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> friend. You uh, in in one of the uh, 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 engineering part of your talk, when yeah. you try to see the interaction between the uh, gluon, you had a design where you can engineer a region where the uh, permittivity is zero. Yes. Right. So and then, then at some point you propose that perhaps this can be realized using the with the help of superconductor for, for magnetic example. fields. Yeah. Right. So I'm a little curious. What is the length scale for this kind of uh, engineering? And is that in, in compatible? The QCD case? Yeah. I mean, is that length scale even compatible with the length scale of superconductivity? No, 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 no. <laughs> no this, this is, this, this is subnuclear. I, I know, but <laughs> I, I'm saying that in that scale, there is no superconductivity that will 100% screen the magnetic field. Right? That, no. that won't work. This is a long way list. No, the, 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 the application to QED is on a different scale. Right, 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 right. So I, I was a little bit confused. What was that uh, comment about superconductivity? Well, superconduct superconductors are perfect diamagnets. Right, but, but not in this scale. No, scale. no, not on this scale. No, <laughs> no, no. Also, you know, you can't make holes that small either. Right, no, no, right, no, right. No, I'm talking about macroscopic superconductivity. So basically. are you implying that there is a way to, for example, in condensed matter system, that using superconductor, we might be able to probe something like this, but yes. maybe not exactly the real gluon, but the quote oh, it's emerged not, it's gluon. It's not even close to the real gluon. Right, but, it has, but the emerged gluon with a similar algebraic yes, structure? It, well, as the simple, similar physical phenomenon okay. of forming in, inside a superconductor, it's a very, it's not a new observation. It's what, it's a very um, important property of superconductors that they want to, uh, uh, confine magnetic flux. Right, right. They, right. Want a, they want the magnetic flux to only be in a small yeah. region, so it makes tubes. And uh, uh, usually that happens in what are called uh, vortices, mm -hmm. which form spontaneously. So inside the superconductor, it makes a little normal region and makes a tube of that. But if you give it a normal region by drilling a hole, it doesn't have to, it doesn't have to do that work. It just, it's just, so this is sort of making artificial vortices. Right. And then yeah. you, do you have a candidate for the potential uh, uh, emerged uh, quarks or something the like that? Electron, where they're electrons. Electrons. So you're basically <laughs> using EMM. You're basically talking about EMM in this case. Yes. Just you one version of that. Yes. All right. All right. Thank you. Okay. 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 <laughs> Let me take the advantage. Uh, very nice talk. I
very <laughs> entertaining talk to, to listen to this. Uh, right. uh, but I have a few questions, but maybe let's start this one. I'm not very sure about this, uh, your trail. Is that uh, still a U1 an analogy of uh, uh, one-dimensional QED, something like that? Oh, one plus one dimension. Uh, well, you could set up similar things in QED. Uh, you can also, of course, study QCD in two dimensions. And if you did it for three colors, you might get something like this. But it's a little, the geometry is impoverished, right? You yeah, don't but, have these Steiner points um, or anything like that. Yeah, but so, I'm, I'm just uh, uh, puzzling about the results because uh, if it's uh, an uh, to take an energy to QED, it's a, it's a, there's some uh, very fundamental difference between QED and uh, QCD, right? Right. Well, not just be, uh, one that you have mentioned that uh, as far as a long, a long range force, uh, not just a linear uh, flux tube. And the other one is uh, actually that was captured by MIT bag. That is, uh, uh, the if you have if you talk about quark, the mass of quark actually is you can take basically zero. Yes. And the bond and the proton is much heavier. Yes. So the it's uh, it's counterintuitive to atomic physics, right? That, uh, so the oh, no, bond, no. the constitute is uh, quantitative is mass. It's uh, the no, it's, no, no. It's, it's, larger it's, than it's very similar actually because the uh, the the um, the mass of an atom is much much larger than the mass of an electron. Yeah, but, but uh, yeah, that, that's uh, that I understand. But but, but you have uh, if you talk about the atom that you you, you have a uh, the the mass the mass of the mass of atom is uh, less than the mass of nucleon plus uh, nucleus plus the electron, right? And yes, that is, uh, a little that's bit because, less. And, but the, but the, for the for the proton it's opposite. Yes. The, so so that is uh, that that is the basic one of the basic feature for QCD, but that is not captured by QED, right? This is what I understand, as I understand. Well, no, no, well if you just considered the electron-electron force, yeah. then that would be a positive contribution to the energy, right? This rep so that, that's, uh, that's more like what you have. You have a, it costs you something to set up the fields. Now, yeah. In 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 uh, nuclear in atoms, when you have forces, when you have charges of opposite sign, then you gain something, and actually it's quite tricky to, to understand that. that in the, but it's basically because you have infinite self fields which get partially canceled. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is what I think. Is it but that that also happens in QCD when you have mesons. I've been I I talked briefly about quark and anti quark. Mm -hmm. configurations. Uh, in that case, you can get the lowering of the energy because that. Uh, okay, but I didn't get, I didn't uh, get uh, a point. Uh, <laughs> right. So that is one of the problems for QED like. Well, so. you have to be very careful about making analogies between QED and QCD. Okay. But, and, and actually QED in one space dimension is a much better model of QCD in three dimensions than QED in three dimensions is. QED in three dimensions is very different from QCD in three dimensions, but QED in one dimension is much more similar. Okay, <laughs> let's that, come to another question. So yes. the, for the QED uh, analogy of uh, one, to one plus one, so, so uh, I, I, let me say that like this one. For MIT back model, it actually says something that the, the, the the face in the in the in the bag is different from face outside. Right. right. So that is that means they have phase transition. Yes. But, but the, when you talk about but one there is no phase transition, right? So. <laughs> but where, okay. This is what okay. Uh, uh, how about but this for way? The, for the one plus one, we we'll, uh, uh, need uh, more time for student uh, <laughs> to, to ask <laughs> questions. Well, let me uh, finish uh, the question, uh, and I'll yeah, give a very short answer. I'll give a very short answer. Well, okay. Anyway, there are no phase uh, transitions. Yeah, anywhere. we yeah so. we hope uh, three and honors program student <laughs> can uh, ask more questions. Uh, this is your class. Uh, <laughs> it's your right to ask uh, questions. Okay. Yeah. yeah, any kind of question is fine. Okay, please. Well, I I just have a. 
some naive questions about the picture of trions. Good. Yeah. You said that to if if I have imagined a picture that to anti trion until anti croc and crocs they yes and uh, tear a little apart they won't they won't um, have a trion at first right because they are very very right um, it only becomes advantageous yeah. when when yeah when you pull far enough apart and yeah exactly how far apart you have to pull depends on what the trion mass is okay so you this mean is a way of measuring the trion mass okay i see that's just the question i want to want uh, i want to ask that's when you tear very far away then boop they will become become two trions and i want to ask where does energy goes any what energy where does energy goes where does the energy go yeah because you know that well you argue... you're well when you're moving these things apart, mm -hmm. uh, you're injecting or, or, or taking energy out of the system. It's not, energy is not conserved when you do these operations. Well, you, you're, exerting, you're, you're, you're exerting forces on the quarks and anti-quarks to move them around. Yeah, yeah but the, at that moment when two lines comes into a trio, yeah. what does At that moment. Well, at that moment, they have exactly the same energy. OK. <laughs> it's very much like in chemistry, where people talk about bringing atoms together to make diatomic molecules. It's the same sort of consideration. Of, you look at energy curves. And, but, I see. Yeah. But if they have the same energy, why they prefer to be two trions rather than two lines? It's lower energy. But because the, uh, if, you, if you have two long lines mm -hmm. with a given energy per unit length, that's a longer length than having just one. <laughs> that's yeah. So, so there are some end effects, but basically it's a matter of having one line as opposed to two. Yeah, but but at that specific time when they come to your trion, they have the same energy. Yes. Yeah, but so at that specific time, why do they prefer to be trions? It wouldn't prefer. It would it would it would go from one to the other. It would, it would, you would have a superposition of those two in quantum mechanics. You'd have a ah. Both things would be present. Oh, I see. That's an example of what chemists sometimes call resonance. But okay. in a, yeah, so that's so when you have degeneracies, indeed, you have to take both into account. So neither one is adequate by itself. Yeah, very good. Okay. Very good yeah. question. Thank you. Uh, all right, all right. Okay, pass. Yeah, the side. Yeah. Well, thank you. I have two. Uh, well. I have two separate questions okay, on, so on ask trion one models. At a, ask one at a time. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, and the first is that um, it seems to be an effective way to uh, describe the behavior of QCD, especially in dealing with confinement state um, at low energy. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so, um, uh, how, so how how do you get um, such a theory from from Sol QCD? Does it rely on numerical simulation, and is it only uh, is it only built based on uh, sole uh, speculation on the numerical result, or it is some natural consequences if you do some manipulations on the original theory? Okay, I think what you're asking is, do we have an exact solution of QCD, which will uh, answer all all questions? And the answer is to that question is definitely not. We don't have such a, so QCD, it's like asking if we have a solution to chemistry. Uh, okay. No, you don't, have, you don't have a solution that work, <laughs> yeah. works in all circumstances to describe all processes. We have to use different pictures and different approximations in different circumstances. Uh, okay, I see. So then for the second question is, uh, when, when you mention, um, there are some construction called tr not, not only trions, but, uh, but also anti-trions. Yes. So do you really mean that trions uh, are particles in, uh, uh, in the means uh, <laughs> that there, there are some harmonic ex excitation of some effective fields? Uh, and also, uh, yes. how do you treat them, whether as dy a real dynamical phase of uh, yes. degrees of freedom or something else? Well, this is a new idea. We don't know how far it can be pushed. Oh, okay. I would hope that as we build up our understanding of what trions are, we can address questions like, can they condense? Could you, could you make a Bose-Einstein? Are they bosons? Well, they're bosons, I know that. But, but can, can they make a Bose-Einstein condensate inside neutron stars? Could they crystallize? There are many, many 
very interesting questions, and we don't know, we just don't know very much about them yet. So we'll, this is, I hope it doesn't take 50 years, but this oh. is going to be a, a, a new chapter in QCD, I think. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right. Okay, we have a, a senior student. <laughs> uh, yes, a, a senior student. Uh, uh, thank you, very nice uh, uh, talk. I just uh, uh, want to add to this student's question. In fact, uh, probably the question is uh, how you try on uh, triangles mimic QCD. Do the commutation relation or the Lie algebra, something no, no, that no. They, they don't uh, <laughs> really they go to uh, each other, right? We're, we're not at that level yet. Well, we're nowhere near that level yet. We just, you know, so we have to explore whether the whole concept holds up at all in these numerical works. And then what happens when you add light quarks, which could change things a lot. So, uh, but let me, but to give a more definite answer, one thing you can do, I mentioned briefly that there's a strong coupling expansion. You can compute these things in a strong coupling expansion systematically. So that might turn out to be quite accurate. So, okay. but, but I mean, it's the lowest order in strong, it's certainly not completely accurate, but gives a qual this qualitative behavior of flux tubes and joining and so mm -hmm. forth. In higher orders, you could address some of these questions. What's the tree on mass? What are the correct, the finite size corrections? How do the, how do the different representations join on to flux tubes? All those things could be addressed in strong coupling. You can, you can also put things in channels. So I think there are, there are quite, a, there, there are uh, probably five or six theses that could be written on the basis <laughs> by just calculating and strong coupling different aspects of this. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you talk about the uh, trail, and then people now talk about in QCD, uh, QCD uh, tetraquarks, uh, yes. uh, pentaquarks. In this picture, you can also construct uh, those uh, objects. Yes, yeah. you could, but that, that requires, you know, building in the light quarks and is much more speculative than, uh, so that's for the future. If, if I... Okay, okay, from a girl. Very good. Yeah. Uh, maybe a trivial question. Uh, is there some similarity between the formation of trion and the flash, uh, flash, frustration in the spin? Uh, I mean, in the uh, magnetic material. Yeah. If there is some uh, triangle uh, lattice. And uh -huh. each vertex has a spin, oh. and it it will be a frustration. A frustration. Is there some similarity? Uh, well, it's an interesting thought. I uh, don't see it right off the top of my head, but maybe there is some deep similarity. I mean, the nice thing about spin, as far as making analogies to QCD, is that it's non-abelian. Right? Oh. You, when you add angular momenta, you 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 don't just there's, you don't just add the quantity of angular momentum. There are vectors, some vectors, and so 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 there so there might be some interesting analogies to spin, but I don't see it immediately. Oh, so at least Good there. Question. Is, thank you. <laughs> at least there is not some uh, theoretical formalism that can describe this. Well, kind there of... might be, but I don't know it. Oh, uh, okay. Thank All you. Right. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. okay. Okay, uh, Professor Rutik, uh, I'm thinking that um, it's like, uh, my understanding is like uh, the formation of a trillion is a way to minimize the energy. Yes. Uh, and uh, I'm thinking, do we have this analogy in momentum space? In momentum space? Well, the closest analogy I can think of in momentum space, there might be better ones, but one, the, as I mentioned, umclap processes, are, an ex are a similar in spirit, where you break down to a smaller group than the translation. So here, try SU3 is non-abelian, so it doesn't give conservation laws. The, the, you can't find charges that are conserved, except that in SU3, there is a center of the group which commutes with everything else. That's a Z3 symmetry. So if you think about three by three matrices with unit determinant, you can have cube roots of unity on the diagonal. So there is a conserved subgroup, and that 
the triality is the uh, representation of that subgroup. So that's well, okay. I, we 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 could discuss it after it gets. But 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 uh, what was the question? <laughs> yeah, is yeah. I'm seeing is kind of my inspir inspiration is from that. Uh, for example, in superconductivity, yes. the phonon mediated interaction is k dependent. Yes. And in 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 this QCD case, is is like uh, this flux tube, the yeah. force. And oh. it's in real space. It's in real space, yes. Yeah. So the flux tube picture as it stands is kind of a static picture. Right? You do minimize the energy when you have fixed sources. But of course, in physics, things move. The quarks, the color sources aren't infinitely heavy. So you want, you'll, you'll want to examine configurations also in which the flux tubes bend or oscillate and things like that. I think one can do that with this channeling idea and then maybe put that back into the effective theory that the, the flux tubes have internal dynamics. I mean, there's a whole subject that you may have heard of called string theory, yeah, which is about the dynamics of <laughs> flux. And, well, in fact, string theory originally was an attempt to uh, describe the strong interaction. So what we would now call a flux tube in QCD is, is sort of the original string. And string theory can get very, very complicated. So yes, so, uh, so, when, so when, when you get beyond these kinds of static pictures, many new questions arise. It's good. See, it yeah. sounds... OK, I hear this uh, uh, ending bear. <laughs> so <Okay>. with this, <laughs> but, uh, oh. Okay, 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 okay. One short question. There'll be other lectures and maybe you can add, okay. Very so, short question. It's, it's, so let me just say for the future, uh, we'll have other discussion sections and you can certainly refer to questions from earlier lectures or discuss something that has nothing to do with the lectures. I'll be, all right. <laughs> so what is the mass of the trains comparing with quarks? We don't know. Um, <laughs> I'm wondering that uh, in the old picture, we already have a conservation of energies without introducing the triumphs. We have what? Uh, conservation of energies. Conservation of energy, yeah. Yes, when you're introducing the triumphs and they have mass, so where is the energy comes from? Well, the trion is, is a, a, an emergent object that's basically a, a, a special kind of clump of gluons. So it's not a separate kind of energy. It's already in the theory. It's just that if you want an effective description at low energies, this is a good thing to focus on. So, yeah. Okay. okay. With this, uh, let's thank Professor Wojciech for okay. this uh, beautiful <laughs> and uh, uh, stimulating you. lectures. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. 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 We, uh, we have uh, several more such uh, lectures. Please uh, join us. Thank you for your coming here today. Okay. Thank you. All right. <laughs> we learned something new. Thank you very much for the very inspiring. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Just arrived yesterday?